Thank you. When I was seven years old, I had this recurring nightmare. I dreamt about this huge and boundless space. There were no trees, no buildings, even no other people in the dream. There was just me. And I was locked up in a tiny iron cage by the old and awful and scary looking Snow White Witch from the fairy tale with the poisonous apple. Now, in that dream, I felt truly terrified. So as soon as I woke up from the nightmare, um, in the middle of the night, I ran to my mom. I was crying. I woke her up and I told her about my nightmare. And she would always reassure me of this simple fact that it was just a dream. That the old witch was just part of my dreaming mind, that there was no real physical danger, these were just dreams. And so feeling a bit more reassured and safe, I returned to sleep. But at one particular night, I had the exact same nightmare in that following sleep period. So suddenly I found myself again in that iron cage, holding on to the iron bars and looking to the old witch, while remembering what my mother said to me just a few hours ago. Tim, this is just a dream. Now, interestingly, that realization did not wake me up. So I knew that I was dreaming while still being in the dream. And I can still vividly recall how I looked around in the dream and had a sense of my own dream body, which felt incredibly real, while I knew that my real physical body was actually lying in bed asleep in some other place called waking life. It was a stunning, very profound experience, and at the same time I didn't feel scared by the old witch because I knew she was just part of my dreaming mind. So I really felt empowered and free. Now, as a seven-year-old kid, uh, I had no idea that these kinds of dreams in which you know that you are dreaming are scientifically referred to as lucid dreams, and that these lucid dreams seem to almost exclusively occur in a sleep stage that we call REM sleep rapid eye movement sleep. And that's the stage in which we experience our most vivid, most immersive dreams. And so these are not your uh, typical one-dimensional daydream-like uh, experiences uh, in which you're just visualizing something and you still have a sense of your own physical body and you're just imagining stuff. Now, in these REM sleep dreams, as would be true for our lucid dreams as well, we are provided with this fully immersive, three-dimensional, multi-sensory hallucinatory experience. So it feels like almost being absorbed into your imagination. You own this dream body that you can use and move around with, not just to look at your dream surroundings, but for example, touch the dream ground, its texture, its hardness. That's how real our dreams are each and every night in REM sleep. It's incredible. You could listen to dream music or to someone's voice in a dream. You could even smell or taste dream food. Wow! Now, uh, at the same time, the lucid dream provides for limitless flexibility, as our dreaming mind is conti continuously listening to and giving shape to our thoughts and intentions while we are dreaming. And so once you turn lucid in a dream, you could consciously and reflectively refocus your thoughts and intentions in order to reshape the entire dream and dream about anything that you can imagine while you are dreaming. And so you could allow an entire dream city to appear, or your favorite sports car, or you could, you could give yourself any kind of superhero power that you can imagine, like flying or walking through walls. Um, or you can just consciously decide to explore the dream, while well, knowing that it is a dream, and just go to the left and, or go to the right, and just leave the dream as it is. Now, lastly, that the lucid dream is a learnable skill. So about 20% of the general population of us has at least one spontaneous lucid dream each month. But now through scientific study, there are various cognitive techniques that anyone can learn to apply in order to have these lucid dreams deliberately. And so now today, there are thousands and thousands of lucid dreamers all over the world who are practicing lucid dreaming to have these extraordinary dream experiences that are impossible or very unlikely according to our ordinary waking life social and physical standards. So for example, their exciting flying dream in which you are a superhero and fly above the clouds, or this exhilarating adventure in which they are the main character in their own blockbuster dream movie or a romantic dream. And of course, there are many other lucid dreams that you can think of because anything is possible in a lucid dream, right? Kind of incredible. Now, if you take a closer look at these three lucid dream features, and you would kind of add them up, you might come to see that the lucid dream provides for this fully immersive virtual simulator. 
right? Now, that functional description is not far from what scientists believe to be the function of our ordinary REM sleep dreams, although, more precisely, the function of threat simulation and its related memory consolidation. So, for example, in the old days, when we would encounter this dangerous bear uh, in waking life, uh, we would be frightened and hopefully be able to survive, then that following night our dreaming mind would pick up on those waking life threats, simulate those in our dreams, in order for our dreaming mind to reinforce on the neural circuits that are involved with the schemas and the expectations and the scripts that we need to effectively survive the next waking life threat the following day when we would encounter a slightly different bear in a slightly different circumstance. Now, in modern days, most people don't um, dream about dangerous bear encounters anymore. We would dream about an angry boss encounter or a family member or a friend or whatever that we need to cope with in order to socially survive. And through that same process, our dreaming mind picks up on those social threats and uh, simulate those in our dreams in order to reinforce those related schemas and scripts and so on. Now, imagine turning lucid in those dreams and to consciously and reflectively enhance that function of psychological development and use the flexibility of the lucid dream to experiment with improved behavior to learn from in the lucid dream. So that then the next day when you would wake up, you could implement those learning experiences and improve your waking life circumstances from what you have learned and experimented with in your lucid dream to improve your psychological well-being. Now, the emerging science of lucid dreaming has now generated evidence to suggest just that, that lucid dreaming can be used as an incredibly valuable tool to enhance psychological development and is now invested into various research areas like nightmare treatment, uh, mental rehearsal, creative problem solving. And so as a lucid dream practitioner myself, as a researcher and a trainer, I teach people from all over the world how to have and apply these lucid dreams and really believe that the application of lucid dreaming is an idea that is worth spreading today at TEDx. Now, scientists were initially quite skeptical about this phenomenon of lucid dreams. They said, well, this is impossible. By definition, dreams lack this reflective awareness, right? That therefore, they are dreams. So this, can just not, this cannot be possible. Others said, well, perhaps the lucid dream is just an ordinary dream in which we merely dream about being lucid, which is something different, right? Others said, well, and still say today, actually, well, Ordinary REM sleep just cannot allow for lucidity, so the lucid dream must be some kind of a hybrid state of consciousness in which one part of the brain is awake while the other part is uh, dreaming. Or some brief awakening from sleep in which our mind still lingers a bit in REM sleep and through that we could know that we are dreaming. Now, in the early 1980s, a sleep researcher called Stephen LeBurge, at that time working at Stanford University, conducted this ingenious experiment to scientifically verify the existence of lucid dreams. And um, he'd done this uh, through uh, basing his uh, experiment on an earlier study that had shown that our dream eye movements are reflected by our actual eye movements behind closed eyelids when we are in bed dreaming. So, for example, when you would be in a dream or a lucid dream, you could look to the left, right, left, right, left, and our actual eye movements behind closed eyelids in bed would also show the same kind of left, right, left, right movement. So Stephen thought, well, that's interesting and quite useful, because obviously we could instruct lucid dreamers as research subjects to make any kind of distinctive eye signal in their lucid dream, therefore verify that they are lucid and that the lucid dream is real. And that's what he did. So what you see here is a one-minute episode of someone who is in the sleep lab hooked up to all kinds of electronics, uh, electrodes, um, and you see um, four different data channels here. The uppermost channel shows the brain activity, in this case, characteristic of REM. The left eye movements, right, right eye movements, and the muscle tone, completely absent in REM sleep, also characteristic of REM. Um, and so Stephen instructed all of his research subjects, including this single case, to make a left-right, left-right eye movement as soon as they, as he, turned lucid in a dream. And make that signal twice once he thought that he had awakened from sleep. So. That next very minute, the subject successfully signals from his REM sleep dream that he is lucid. I'm lucid, making the eye signals. The next minute, something strange happens. The subject signals that he's awake, 
while the data shows that he's clearly still in REM sleep, I mean, no muscle tone, brain activity, that is characteristic of REM, and obviously the researchers see him still being asleep, so, hmm, what's happening here? Then the next minute, the subject makes a lucid eye signal again, but makes an incorrect one first and corrects for it. Only a few moments later, he actually awakens from sleep. You can see the muscle tone reappears and the according brain activity that is characteristic of wakefulness. Now, at that point, the researchers came into the lab, approached the subject and said, what were you just dreaming about? And the subject said, I had a lucid dream. And I successfully signaled that I was lucid. But then a few moments later, I only dreamt about waking up in the sleep lab. And some weird-looking sleep researcher came to me, ripped off the electrodes from my skull, and I thought, well, that's bold. <laughs> that's not the correct procedure. Perhaps I'm still dreaming. And so I rediscovered that I was dreaming, did the lucid signal again, but made a mistake first. So I waited a moment for you guys to know in the sleep lab that I would redo the signal, <laughs> did the lucid signal again, until a few moments later I woke up. Incredible. Now, this piece of evidence clearly shows undoubtedly that lucid dreaming is real and that it happens during uninterrupted REM sleep dreaming. Now, today there's much more advanced technology in which we can study the lucid dream state and compare it to the waking state and the state of REM, REM sleep. And so now scientists are discussing whether REM sleep could allow for this reflective awareness or whether the lucid dream is this hybrid state of consciousness, a different state in which one part of our brain is awake while the other part is dreaming. And many more future studies are needed to turn these theories into facts. However, all of this research has led us to a far better, uh, better understanding of how to train people to become frequent lucid dreamers and to assign them to all kinds of interesting lucid dream experiments in which they could do all kinds of things in their lucid dreams. And so then scientists could study and explore the way the effect, the effect of those lucid dreams on their waking life performance. And so now scientists are venturing into, oops, uh, into nightmare treatment. Think about someone who is suffering from a post-traumatic disorder, who has, for example, served in wartime and still has these terrible nightmares about being in war and need to fear for, their, uh, fear for his life. How lucid dreams can be used to treat those nightmares and to complement their daytime therapies by training such a patient to become lucid in his nightmare and to resolve and rescript the nightmare while he is having it, rather than only in a retrospective way the next day and just talking about it. Now, the evidence shows that lucid dreaming can indeed be used for that purpose, to treat nightmares, which is an incredibly valuable application. Mental rehearsal. So think about sport athletes, how they can make use of the immersive lucid dream to rehearse peak performances, to prepare for sport competitions, uh, and, and rehearse all kinds of complex sport movements. Again, evidence is showing that lucid dreams can be used for this purpose. Incredible. Creative problem solving. How we can make use of the creative nature of our REM sleep dreams to come to new ideas. Visualize a business solution. Visualize your new refurnished home and experiment with it in the lucid dream. Or rehearse and develop your TEDx presentation. Um, now, despite the fact that lucid dreaming is not yet formally employed in psychiatric practices and many more future studies are needed to support the claims that I just made, research clearly shows the use and power of, of lucid dreaming to improve our psychological well-being. And so I would really like to encourage researchers and training professionals to embrace this phenomenon of lucid dreaming, to inspire and more effectively equip patients athletes and our general lucid dream practitioners of tomorrow. And I would also like to encourage you to have a lucid dream and to explore this fascinating state of consciousness and not just to empower and improve your dream life, but your waking life as well. Thank you. <laughs>